Today, I am going to start the book, Single Sufficient Virtue, and this is a teaching by Ken Polkarta Rinpoche on a teaching by Kalu Rinpoche. So I want to start out by talking about Kalu Rinpoche, who he was, and his life. Some of you have done Nyungne here, and the go-to book for Nyungne is written by a student of Kalu Rinpoche, Wang Chen Rinpoche. In fact, as a child, Wang Chen Rinpoche would travel with Kalu Rinpoche. Now, Kalu Rinpoche was born in the Kham area of Tibet in 1905. He began his studies at the age of 13 at Palpung monastery. This is the seat of the Situ Rinpoches. It was the seat of the 11th Situ Rinpoche. The present Situ Rinpoche is the 12th Situ Rinpoche. So he was ordained by the 11th Situ Rinpoche. Again, the uh, Situ Rinpoches have been close to the Karmapas for a very, very long time. So he started out, you might say, close to the top with this relationship with Situ Rinpoche at Palpun Monastery. So he studied intensively for two years on the sutras and the tantras, received a lot of empowerments and Vajrayana instructions from great lamas because Palpun would attract these great lamas. And then he started teaching and among his other teachers were Jamyang Kensei Choki Lodro, who was a great Rime scholar. And he also gave empowerments and instructions and transmissions to this Jamyang Kensei Choki Lodro. Soon after that, he entered a three year retreat with the Lama in charge of it being a Lama Norbu Dondrup. And he received instructions in both the Karma Kagyu and the Shangpa Kagyu. The Shangpa Kagyu are, if you remember the Mahamudra lineage supplication, the four great and eight lesser lineages. It's one of those, I believe, a lesser lineage, and it had been in decline for a long time. So he studied both of those in three-year retreat. Then, beginning at the age of 25, this would have been in 1930, he practiced for 12 years in solitary retreat in mountain caves in Kham, wandering about without possessions, a bit like Milarepa. And then, finally, in 1942, the 11th C2 Rinpoche asked him to return and begin teaching. If you remember what he looked like when he was alive, Kalu Rinpoche always looked like he was very thin. And I'm sure that he was a very thin person right from the get-go when you're out in the middle of calm with no possessions, meditating in caves. So he came back and he became the director of a three-year retreat at Palpung. And then later, the 16th Karmapa recognized him of one of the emanations of Jamgun Kantro Lodro Taye. He was an activity emanation. Jamgun Kantro Lodro Taye was a great master in the 19th century. He lived 1813 to 1899, and his writings were extensive. He traveled around Tibet and revived the teachings of many of these lineages that were dying out. There were many stories about him and how much he accomplished and the writings that he preserved, the teachings that he preserved. In the 1950s, Kala Rinpoche left Tibet because of the Chinese invasion. He went to Bataan then. He established two retreat centers and ordained 300 monks there. Then he began to travel around the world. And as he traveled around the world, he established Dharma centers and three-year retreat centers. 
He established one center in Wappinger Falls in New York, about an hour away from KTD. He established one in France, other places of Europe, in India. I think one on the west coast of the United States, but I'm not positive about that. But oh, wherever he went, he established centers, and these were centers about serious practice. The three-year retreats practiced the six dharmas of Naropa and the six dharmas of Naguma. They are slightly different, but they are related. The three-year retreat at Karmeling that I was at, we practiced the six dharmas of Naropa. And what six dharmas means is basically six different practices. But these practices, it's not a simple practice like just doing chenrezi. There are things like dream yoga, a bardo, illusory body, and so on and so forth. So he emphasized Vajrayana, empowerments, transmissions, instructions. The Tibetan is Wang, Lung, and Tree. Wang is the actual empowerment where you have a Vajra master leading a ceremony. The Lung is the reading transmission where the practice that you do is read quickly in Tibetan. And the tree means the actual instructions on how to do the practice. And of course, he taught Mahamudra. Interesting enough, it is this Kalu Rinpoche who introduced the custom of Chenrezi meditation as the principal practice in many centers. It's the same Chenrezi that we do. He didn't write the practice, but he introduced it and encouraged it to be done. In 1983, he gave the Rinchen Terzo to the four regions of the Karmapa. And again, this is a very complicated and long transmission and advanced transmission. And the four regions would be Tai Situ, present Tai Situ Rinpoche, Shamarpa, Jamgun Kantral, and then Yelsop Rinpoche. Those are the four regions. So it took a very important person to be able to give these transmissions to these four regions for the Karmapa. By this time, the 16th Karmapa had his para-nirvana, and the 17th Karmapa had not been discovered. Now, on May 10th in 1989, in his monastery in Sonata, India, Kalu Rinpoche had his para-nirvana. I never had a chance to meet the first Kalu Rinpoche. His Yangtze, or the second Kalu Rinpoche, was born in 1990, recognized by Tai Sutra Rinpoche in 1992, and he was formally enthroned in February of 1993. When I was in three-year retreat, this young Kalu Rinpoche came into retreat and visited us. He was brought in by Bokar Rinpoche. Oh, going back to this Rinchen Terzo, the reading transmission of this and the empowerments takes four to six months to give you an idea of how elaborate this process is. And it comes from one of the five great treasuries of Jamgun Kantra the Great. To talk a little bit about Mahamudra, that is the next point to go into. Mahamudra means, quote, the great seal or the great symbol. It, quote, suggests that all that exists in the conditioned world is stamped with the same seal, the seal of ultimate reality, end quote. This comes from a book by Traleg Rinpoche titled Mind at Ease, which is about Mahamudra. But this gives you an idea, like a wax seal that you might place on an important letter that is a seal of authenticity. That is what this great seal means. Ultimate reality is synonymous with emptiness, but this emptiness needs to be properly understood. That emptiness is the underlying groundlessness, spaciousness, the indeterminacy in experiences. 
both the subjective world and the objective world. But besides that, which can give you the idea of, well, there's nothing, it doesn't matter. It's more than that. Emptiness is luminous. It is blissful. There is this awareness. Luminous means that it has a capacity to know or to cognize. So it is spacious, it is groundless, it is beyond words, but it also is luminous, it's active, it has the capacity to know, even if you might not be able to put into words what you know. There's a Zen saying, and Rinpoche used it, so it might be in Tibetan Buddhism too, is that the teachings are the finger pointing at the moon, because the teachings are verbal. And you have to quit looking at the finger if you're going to see the moon. But once you see the moon, you are like a person that is unable to speak. You know you've seen it, but you can't say anything about it. Again, Kralik Rinpoche's book, he describes the natural state as, quote, self-sustaining, self-existing, not dependent on anything, end quote. Mahamudra is beyond concept beyond duality. It is beyond the idea of samsara and nirvana. If you remember the Mahamudra lineage supplication uh, towards the end, it talks about the inseparability of samsara and nirvana, that they have the same underlying nature. They come from the same place. You don't have one place that is the source of samsara and another place that is the source of nirvana. And we have to eliminate samsara, and then we have nirvana. It's that you see that they are inseparable. And a mind is compared to space. Space accommodates everything without judgment. Virtue, vice, happiness, suffering, good, bad, beautiful, ugly, all of this exists together. Again, within emptiness, these opposites are inseparable. So the fundamental aim in Buddhism and Buddhist practice is to attain enlightenment. And it is through our spiritual practice that we aim to become more aware, more conscious, more harmonious inside and out. And in doing so, and there are different methods of doing this, ignorance and replace it with wisdom. So Buddhist practice of all forms are about how to perceive ourselves in a genuine fashion, in an authentic fashion, how to overcome ignorance. And in order to do this, we have to remove what are called the three veils. The first veil is habitual patterns. We are creatures of habit and we have lots of habitual patterns. Rinpoche once said that habitual patterns are the most insidious form of karma. We get used to doing things in a certain way, and they become very strong habitual patterns. Underneath the habitual patterns are, are conflicting emotions, are poisons of the mind. That's what klesha means, is poison of ignorance, aggression, and attachment and desire. And you might as well add to that pride and jealousy. And then underneath that is dualistic thinking. This is the third veil, taking that which is not a self to be a self and that which is not other to be an other. Once we have separated self from other, then we like other or don't like other. We're attached to it. We have aggression to it. We want to just ignore the whole thing, or maybe we're jealous, or we think we've got a better deal and have a lot of pride and think we're better than other. But whatever, it's all based on self and other. Now, there are different vehicles or paths to enlightenment to remove those three veils and uncover this luminous, spacious, inherent nature inside all of our minds essential quality of our minds. There is the Hinayana or the foundation vehicle, which is renunciation. The Mahayana vehicle is purification. The Vajrayana is transformation. Kralag Rinpoche feels that Mahamudra 
could be rightfully called a fourth jnana or a fourth path. And this is self-liberation. So to go into these four briefly, that renunciation means of the foundation path that practitioner renounces and eventually eradicates unwholesome behavior, attitudes, values. Renunciation can be looked at as compassion towards oneself, that our attitudes and values and behavior are replaced with more caring attitudes and behavior. Foundation level teachings are the Four Noble Truths, the teaching on selflessness, interdependence, karma, and so forth. The guru is looked at as a respected elder. The fruition of the foundation path traditionally is looked at as a, the Tibetan word is a drachongpa, which means is a, a foe conqueror, an arhat. You've conquered the kleshas. You no longer get angry. You no longer become attached to have strong attachment. But there still is this sense of a self that has accomplished this. So this brings in then the purification of the Mahayana. And the Mahayana, we purify and reconcile our unwholesome behavior and our states of mind. We have the six paramitas or transcendent virtues that we practice. Wisdom and compassion are stressed. Here, the guru is considered a friend in virtue. Now, for Vajrayana or transformation, we have visualizations. We visualize ourselves as an enlightened being. We do chanting. There's a lot of mantra repetition. Uh, we identify ourselves as an enlightened deity. But we see that our own negativities, our negative habits, our emotions are just the confused aspect of an enlightened deity. One way to put this is the goal is the path. The goal is to be an enlightened deity. And so we see ourselves as an enlightened deity and we visualize ourselves as that way and so on down the line. Now, Vajrayana is very powerful and therefore it requires a closer relationship with the guru. And you can go quickly downhill, so to speak, if it's done incorrectly. Fortunately, and this might be one reason why, as I mentioned earlier, Kalu Rinpoche introduced this regular Chenrezig practice, as Kempo Karta Rinpoche said, Chenrezig is harmless. By doing that, you can't go downhill. Chenrezig is a peaceful, enlightened deity. Then with the Vajrayana, frequently Nundro practice is introduced. And Nundro means literally that which goes before. Now, if you read the fine print on the Nundro text, it says Mahamudra Nundro. So that leads to Mahamudra or self-liberation. And Trollic Rinpoche has this quote that, first of all, it's mystical, self-liberation and mystical. Quote, mystical means it transcends the reference points of most worldly activities. Quote, we are not attempting to renounce, purify, or transform anything at all. Instead, the idea is to allow our negativities and conflicting emotions to become self-liberated. End quote. So our kleshas have no intrinsic nature. When you see this, this cuts through them and liberates them in their place. You don't have to eliminate them. You don't have to wear them out, which is the Mahayana. And you don't have to transform them, which is the Vajrayana. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the five Buddha families, but each of the five Buddha families are associated with a particular negative emotion and the transformation of that emotion into a certain type of wisdom. So again, this is Vajrayana. Mahamudra cuts through all of that.